everyone. Good evening. Welcome to another Tuesday night broadcast of my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. I know it's been a while. I apologize. We've been off for a while. Uh, it is a tremendous burden to try to do this podcast every week, uh, especially when you're not feeling well. Uh, my voice was pretty messed up last week. I ended up going to uh, one of the wellness clinics here in town and uh, they put me on some stuff so I was kind of swelled up here and uh, you know I just was scratchy and coughing pretty bad so I was negative for COVID and I was negative for strep so that was a good thing uh, but it gave me another week to prepare for uh, this episode this episode is going to be one of the most challenging ones I've done just for the fact that I don't know this history as well as some of the other histories it's not in my wheelhouse you know double tough and the first five famous stallions and some of those guys like that there uh, that's in my wheelhouse i know that stuff i can write a book on it i did in fact and uh, but these guys were kind of forgotten breeders but they still did a big part of poas and people there's going to be people that remember them uh and they were in the 60s some a little bit in the 70s uh, so we're going to honor them tonight by talking about him. About him. Again, this is uh, episode 24 of my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank some people tonight for uh, pictures we're going to see and some information. So uh, Barb Fearmeyer, she lives in uh, uh, Florida now. She was in Toledo, Ohio. She had the uh, Telequa POAs, if you remember them from the 70s and the 80s, and she knew uh, some of these people very well, especially the totem poles, and uh, she was a big fan of the Siri uh, bloodline. She still pronounces it the other way, uh, like I believe Paula Cooper did. Uh, she doesn't say Siri. Uh, she says it Sarah or however she pronounces it. Hopefully she's watching tonight. I uh, had the good fortune of speaking to her on the phone again today. It's always a pleasure to reminisce with the POA people that know so much about history. And uh, she, her Telequa POA is, again, kind of a little bit lost in the, in the history, but she raised some good POAs, and uh, she had Totem Siri controversy and some good Telequa POAs out in Ohio. So uh, she said her Internet might be down. They were having a problem, but she was maybe going to go somewhere and try to watch us, so I hope, sure hope she can. Uh, I know Jan's watching tonight from Iowa. She said, hi, Kent. Tracy Keen, I can see you. Uh, so that's good. I know some of our good regulars tonight. I got some uh, things to do, so they're going to miss it live. But uh, Jeremy and Julia usually watch. They got something going on tonight. Uh, Jerry Holm, I want to shout out to him. He sends me some emails once in a while. He's an older POA breeder and uh, exhibitor, raised his kids in POAs from Illinois. And, uh, you know, DH is Adam 80 and some of those POAs. They had Country Boy, TAH. Lizzie Barr came from his breeding program. He watches usually every week. So, again, I'm back, glad I'm back on here. I'm going to try to uh, rip off some weeks in a row, but uh, it's tough to do every week. So, you know, if I'm not on here one week, just know it's still going on. Just sometimes I need a little more time. So uh, the next person I want to thank after Barb is Rhett uh, Bachman. He grew up in POA, showing some of these totem POAs and showing with Barb. I believe he's a a very uh, well-known uh, dog exhibitor now and uh, he grew up like I said in POAs was a good showman back in the 70s then Marilyn Graff most people know Marilyn she's still in Michigan she had the famous cams POAs and uh, they were around for a long time and she knew most of these people uh, that we're going to talk about tonight and own some oak shadows and some totems and stuff and then uh, Karen Bent sent me some pictures uh, several months ago she sent me some good memorabilia from her mom's place she grew up in POAs and they had some oak shadows POAs and stuff and she's a national champion breeder now Karen she has Takapa Tough and some good POAs out in Pennsylvania she's been a good friend of mine for a long time due to the POA sale I used to sit next to her at the POA sale and that's how I met her so fond memories there so uh, Barb, Rep, Marilyn and uh, Karen, I don't know if all of you are watching tonight, but thank you uh, for providing information and pictures. So our topic tonight is Dr. and Evelyn Armstrong from Kalamazoo, Michigan. They had Oak Shadows POAs. They got out in 1969, so we're talking a lot of older history here. I was born in 72, so this family got out of POAs before I was even born. 
Uh, the next family is Earl and uh, Elsie Clark from Totem Poles POAs. They originally were raising POAs in Northville, Michigan, which wasn't too far from the Ohio border. And then later they moved to Traverse City, which if you know geography, that's way up by the Mackinac Bridge. That's way up in northern Michigan. They didn't raise as many POAs once they moved up there. Uh, but the, we'll talk about some of the totem poles and the, how they love the Siri bloodline. And then uh, Bill and Mary Miller is the one we're going to talk about the, at the end. We're not going to talk too much about them because I just don't know a lot about them. Hopefully somebody can chime in and know stuff about them. But uh, Dots Enough was their POIs. And they just basically continued the Clarks. Uh, Mary Miller and uh, Elsie Clark were sisters. So... Earl Clark and Bill Miller married sisters, and that's how uh, they continued on raising some of the, basically the totem poles, but they called them Dots Enough. So, and they were in Hudson, Michigan. So we're talking about Kalamazoo, Hudson, Northville, and a little bit of Traverse City. So let's start looking at some pictures here. I want to thank everybody for watching. I know Tracy's on here and Jan, and I got a couple other people that said, hey, uh, that I don't see your your name yet, but uh, so if you want to shout out, if you're not on Ecamm Live, uh, I don't know who you are, but I can read your uh, contributions, so that's good. Just keep on writing stuff, and I appreciate everything that that everyone says. It means a lot to me. So, uh, so there he is, Robert J. Armstrong, M.D., and everybody called him Doctor Armstrong, and he said he wanted to be recognized as Doctor Armstrong. He said he went to medical school and it cost him so much and so much of his time of his life that he didn't want to be called Mr. Or Sir, he wanted to be called Doctor. So and that's what most people in POAs called him was Dr. Armstrong. And again, he raised the Oak Shadow POAs. Now, more than just raising the Oak Shadow POAs, one of the things he did was he brought some bloodlines and some stallions to Michigan that wouldn't have had a chance to go that far east if it wasn't for Dr. Armstrong. And one of those was dragon so now a lot of people talk about barkeeper and barkeeper was the first syndicated poa stand but dr armstrong was involved in a couple partnerships that they called syndications way back then and one of them was dragon and it was dr armstrong james bicknell the third who was a president of the poa club from michigan the national poac in the 60s and then harold rocky those three michigan breeders uh, bought dragon at the international sale uh, from Hunt's Triple H, of course, from Fairfield, Iowa. So Dragon didn't stay around in Michigan too long. He passed away not long after he got there, but they did have a few foals out of him or by him. And again, it just gave the famous Dragon from Mexico and then Texas and Iowa, it pushed him east of the Mississippi uh, to Michigan and, and spread some new blood there. So that's a good picture of those three men the day they purchased him. There he is after they had him and they were advertising him at stud. Look at that $100 stud fee for Dragon 103. And if you want to know more about Dragon, you can go back. I believe it's like our third or fourth episode is Dragon. Uh, and all these episodes, all 24 of them now, counting this one, of course, are on the POA Facebook group. That group's been going on for about 11 years. We almost have 2,000 members. We're at 1,900 plus. We're about ready to break over if you know anybody that's interested in poas or grew up in poas but lost track of it reach out to them and tell them hey there's some great history that happens uh, on the poa history group on facebook so here's when uh this article was in the magazine i believe when dragon passed away and evelyn armstrong and norm stevenson of course norm was the dragon ends guy from texas and believed in the dragon bloodline he crossed it with a lot of horse blood but uh, so Mrs. Armstrong and Norm Stevenson wrote this article together that appeared in the POA magazine about Dragon. I think that's a pretty cool picture of him there, too. Uh, so that's a little different shot than they usually use. Tracy wonders how many ponies actually trace back to Dragon today. More than you'd think, Tracy. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not tens of thousands out of the 50-some thousand POAs that's been registered, but... It's thousands of POIs uh, traced back to him. And ones that are still showing today is probably in the hundreds, I would say. Uh, yeah, that is a good photo of him. So, so Dragon was one of them that went to Michigan due to uh, Dr. Armstrong. Another one is Eagle Rock. 
And this is Mrs. Helen Latch, who's a very famous POA person. Of course, Elroy Latch was her husband who passed away. They were very active in POAs. He passed away fairly young in the, I believe, in the 60s. And then Wayne Latch and his family became famous POA breeders, and they had uh, Cutie McHugh that won the Futurity in 84. But this is Mrs. Helen Latch, and uh, she was the secretary treasurer of the POAs forever. She's in the Hall of Fame, of course. And this was her 1965 International Show Grand Champion Stay in Eagle Rock. And there again, four guys from Michigan purchased him. They called it a syndicate. And you see the man in the struck cowboy hat to the right, right next to Mrs. Latch with the glasses on. That's Dr. Armstrong. So he helped bring Eagle Rock to Michigan. Another POA, maybe the best of the three. Uh, Eagle Rock didn't become a legend, really. A national grand champion and of course dragon became a legend and in my book kootenay's wee willie was a legend he's chapter six and in spots included that i wrote and here he is of course he was a famous racing poa and a little guy he wasn't very tall they say 49 and a half here his sire was a fast poa as well and uh this is uh when daryl dalton from utah consigned him to again the national sale and Dr. Armstrong purchased him outright with no partners, I believe, for $1,900, which was quite a bit of money. They no sell them at $1,550, and they wanted $2,000 for him, and they settled for $1,900. Uh, and again, that got him from Utah. He was the famous horse out in the West, the racehorse, and Danny Boy was the famous one in the East. So when Dr. Armstrong purchased uh, Kootenay's Wee Willie and brought him to Michigan, that kind of stirred things up a little bit. And uh, they used him for a little while. Now here's the, it kind of goes in steps here. You see the sales catalog entry. Now here's the congratulation uh, full page ad in the POA magazine to Dr. and Mrs. R.J. Armstrong, Kalamazoo, Michigan, for purchasing Kootenay's Wee Willie. Look at that registration number. 1609 was his registration number. And of course, he, again, if you have a copy of Spots Included, go back and look at that. And uh, He's, I believe, chapter six, and uh, his whole life story is in there. He went, uh, wound up in Texas with Norm Stevenson, who we previously mentioned about the dragons and dragonins. He had Kootenay's Wee Willie as well for a long time, and, and he died on Norm's ranch down there in Texas. So here's an ad. Again, it's going full circle. Oak Shadows Farm, having an ad for their famous little stallion. Born in 1961, 49 and a half inches, many times grand champion, uh, international reserve champion staying in 66, holder of the POA international race record at 350 yards. Okay, so here is Wee Willie when he was on the cover. And he became a cover boy of the POAs. He was on the cover of the POA magazine twice at least, and this was in 68, right after... Uh, he headed to Michigan. This is when Armstrong's had him on the cover. And this is what they wrote about him. This was uh, the cover story back then. They didn't have a full page cover story ad, but it's pretty cool what they wrote about him. Again, about his record and then about him showing in halter. He was trained in cutting as well and how John Ludwig bought I believe one of his sons because he was into racing too. So he bought one of the DeLeo's um, but that's a good cover story. So Armstrong didn't keep Kootenay's Wee Willie too long. He ended up going to Indiana to uh, Wernz, who had uh, quite a few great POAs like Bear Paw and Chief Tequila. And uh, we'll probably have an episode about them. They had Miami Mischief was a mayor and some of those uh, great POAs of the late 60s. And they had Kootenay's Wee Willie for a while, and then they consigned him to the the sale and that's when norm stevenson bought him and he ended up going to texas but he was a pretty uh, neat built poa for only being 49 and a half and you gotta remember he was born in 1961 so that was 60 what 60 years ago he was born that's a pretty cool little pony there and he was fast fast pony so that was part of the armstrong story bringing him to michigan and then he went and wound up in indiana because of them as well and here's one of his famous sons. I just threw this in. This isn't uh, because of Armstrong's, but Willie Sundowner. I'm sure there's people watching tonight that know kids that rode Willie Sundowner. He became a supreme champion. I think he won the international as a baby, and then he became a, an international champion gilding. He roamed out. He was one of the first 
snow caps really that got attention, but he was a gilding, so it didn't matter. Uh, but he was Kootenai's Wee Willie's, one of his most famous sons. And you see a famous name there, Bob Stofus from Illinois. They had 7M's Warrior Bonnet and some other good uh, famous POAs. And here they had uh, a picture of Willie's Sundowner born in 68. So I just included that in here. Another early stallion that the Armstrongs and Oak Shadows had was Johnny Fox. And he's got a cool number, 2212. Again, 49 and a half. He was kind of eerily similar to Kootenai's Wee Willie. He wasn't as versatile. Uh, but you see here, too, they, uh, they were advertising his, his Siri bloodline there, an Arab Taj Wild car. Uh, of course, that's the sire to Siri Chief. But he doesn't look like the Siri background in the head he did a little bit, but he didn't have the leopard coloring. But uh, he was a cool little stallion. He didn't go on again to be really household name famous like some of those early stallions uh, but he was was a pretty cool stallion and he was advertised quite a bit uh, Tracy said I remember him Willie Sundown I figured she would I know there's good there might even be somebody that comments that they knew the family that families that had him or or that they actually showed him because he was a, a household name as a gilding Willie Sundowner so so here's a stallion that was in Connecticut and he's it says right in this ad here Husky Hank, he's number 29. I just included this because I love early history. And he, one of his sons he sired was uh, a couple Oak Shadows. So Oak Shadows Chief Wabass, I believe is how you say that. So, and we're gonna see a picture of him. So that's Husky Hank, if you've never seen a picture of him. I'm thinking about having a uh, show about some of the early POAs, maybe like the first 50, and try to find as many pictures as I can of the first 50 or so or maybe first 100 and just have a show on that and if you guys have any ideas for shows uh just let me know i'm always uh open i may tweak it a little bit you know but i'm open to suggestions so so here's the son of uh husky hank they were talking about oak shadows chief wabass and uh it says their son of husky hank who was by apache chief number four of course apache chief sired apache Brave, number 13, who was the first grand champion stallion at the international show. But this is a nice little lad for Oak Shadows Farm. This would have been in the mid-60s. They kept a few of their sons, but Dr. Armstrong believed in the, the gilding stake and stuff and the show and gilding, so he gilded quite a few more than his wife wanted. I think they let some pretty nice stallion prospects go as gildings. Now we know that for breeders, that's something we do you know, because it helps, uh, you know, it just helps promote your farm. So, cause especially if you keep some of your fillies because you fall in love with your fillies and you want to promote your own within, you know, your, keep your broodmares, if you like them, your fillies. So sometimes there's some colts that get gilded uh, and go out there. So there he is again, a full page ad. Also that stud, Johnny Fox, Little Joe, and Little Joe's Prince. So again, that was an early Oak Shadows uh, ad from Kalamazoo there. Here's one with uh, the two stallions, Johnny Fox and Oak Shadows Chief Wabass. Breeders East of the Mississippi was this page, and Armstrong's was the first one on the top there. Yep, he gilded him, they said. so. And somebody just said they bred to Johnny Fox. I don't know if that's Barb that... Uh, whoever just made the comment, he gilded that stallion. Please, uh, please say who you are, because I can't tell. So here's uh, Johnny Fox, Kootenai's Wee Willie, and another one of their stallions, Oak Shadows Jackspot, that we're going to talk about. And I had some good original pictures from Karen Bent that she had from her mother. Some of them didn't make uh, this show because it's so hard to get them on here. Uh, but I got a lot of pictures on here of him. He was a uh, loud colored. So this is a good ad of three of their stallions. Now this would have been in the late 60s. It would have had to be in 68 because uh, they bought Kootenai's Wee Willie in 67. Betty Vardarello, oh, okay, from Michigan. She should know. That's good. Okay, there's another one of uh, Oak Shadow's Jack Spot. He was an own son of Corrett Scottish Chieftain. So you know a lot of Scottish Chieftain sons were Corrett's, uh, but this one was... Uh, both Corrats. I think he probably came from Corrat. I'd have to look that up. But this is after he moved to a different town in Michigan, after he left Armstrong's. 
He was advertised quite a bit. A pretty fancy colored POA. There he is again. Cool lad there. He was a little taller than those other guys. 52 and a half. Black and white. So Dr. Armstrong ran for the board of directors in the 60s and he won. He became a board of director. This was his write-up like they still do today. And uh, this was the first part of it. He liked his pipe, I guess. And this is the second part. Uh, he's a mason in the shrine, past president of the University of Michigan alumni in Kalamazoo and some of the things he was a director of. So he was a very educated, smart man. And uh, he helped the POA for a few years as a board of director. Here's one of mine that I kind of, this is one of my favorites of Oak Shadows, and I don't know a lot about this POA, and I might be butchering these names, Betty and Barb, you might be able to help out. Of course, you don't have sound, you just have to type it out, but uh, Oak Shadows Wabashi is how I'd say it, Wabashi, and that's a cool name if you say it fast, and uh, just look at that head and neck for back in the 60s. It's the 6,000th registered POA, 60. 6,038, so pretty early on, uh, but we're still talking about the 60s. And yeah, Tracy, that's a pretty one there. It's getting a little more modern, ain't it? You can start to see the hip isn't quite like we want it, and the legs are parked out a little bit, but the top line's getting there, and the neck and shoulder and the head's starting to get there. So I owned him, okay. Somebody just said that comment, I owned him, so that's cool. So we're hitting on some personal history tonight. I like that. I love that, in fact. I'm glad. And hopefully there's people like Terry in Iowa and different people like that that's watching and uh, that, you know, learn some stuff about POs. I learn stuff every time I research this. I, you know, I don't know all the facts and stuff. I know a lot of them, but I enjoy researching it because I, I discover some stuff. Betty, keep your comments coming. Maybe just put... Uh, Betty behind it or whatever so I know that it's you I'm going to know pretty quick because you got the personal touch here so here's another POA from Oak Shadows that's took on a little more modern look and this is Oak Shadows Wakazoo and Saddle Talk of course Saddle Talk became Marilyn Graff you know she her and her daughter Sue had uh, that magazine Saddle Trot Talk and that became their moniker for a long time Again, I want to give a shout out to Marilyn. She uh, she was a great POA breeder, bred a lot of cams. Uh, you know, Melissa Slayton's foundation mare was a cams mare, the mother to TMD's two-eyed rawhide. Of course, his son Superman's still going, and a lot of his sons now and daughters. So uh, cams is still very uh, prevalent in uh, great POAs today. So this was an Oak Shadows uh, from from Graf and Maryland's going to be all through this Michigan conversation and we'll probably do a story on on her program down the road as well we're probably not going to run out of programs to do because uh, there's just so many great POA people to talk about yep Cam's kid of course was one of the first one of the great all-time gildings and his owner uh, hit her daughter who's talking tonight Betty they owned Cam's kid of course he was a great POA so and there's other, other great cams too. So here's just an ad from Oak Shadows. A lot of writing here, no pictures. Back in the day, sometimes it was hard to get Polaroid pictures and stuff, so they would just, you know, print a lot of, a lot of their ads. This is a cool thing that happened with Oak Shadows. I don't know if they paid for it, if they just won it, or if it was just a happenstance or coincidence, but they had the number 9,000 registered POA and this is a cool picture this is the sire the dam and the foal Oak Shadows Katie Jack and of course that's Oak Shadows Jackspot uh, back there is the sire and then that's an Oak Shadows mare too so that's a pretty cool picture and a cool ad and yeah, Cam's kid was out of an Oak Shadows mare I think we'll talk about that mare in a little bit here uh, so here's the full ad that the POAC ran and congratulated uh, Oak Shadows Farm with the number 9,000th registered POAs in history. So that's a pretty cool story there, especially when you consider how many do we have right now, Tracy? 55,000? I don't think we've hit 60 yet. But I know I remember when number 50, I remember from number 40 and 50 when we hit those uh, for sure. 
here's a picture that was a pretty cool picture and they we'll see an ad for this later too and uh, they said it wasn't planned or they would have removed the solid full which is kind of funny now because we don't uh, ding them as bad now when we get a solid but back then it was you know a blow to the blow to your breeding program if you got a solid full but there was one over on the the right and they mentioned that and they had that if they would have planned the photo they would have removed the solid full but that's still cool they're at the manger there and four mares and four babies and they're all pretty loud colored except for that one that's a pretty cool picture this would have been probably about 68 or so uh, in Kalamazoo here's another cool ad from them they had some nice ads Now, by the time the Armstrongs got into POAs, their children had already grown, so they didn't uh, they didn't ride in POAs. And again, that was, it was 17 and under when it first started, and then it became 18 and under. And of course, now it's all ages. But uh, so they they did like a lot of breeders do. They went and got kids, neighbor kids, and 4-H. They were big in 4-H and traveled around with kids showing. And uh, they didn't show. A lot, but they showed quite a bit. They showed in Michigan a lot. So in open shows and 4-H and POA shows. So, okay, one of my foals was 55, 555. That's cool. And Tracy said she had 54, 496. All right, so we're in the mid, mid 50s right now. It'll be a big deal when we hit 60,000. Should be. So here's some more Oak Shadows. Uh, Rocky Peacock and another one over there both 68's one's by Eagle Rock and one's by Johnny Fox so as late as 68 they were still using both those I thought this was a cool picture here I, I like this head uh, on this you can tell Lannons is on the bottom they always had good headed stuff and uh, little John S was a Scottish chieftain son that the sharping brothers the breeders of black swan s out in uh, south dakota they had little john s and uh, here's a oak shadows son of him and uh, i just like this picture that's why i included it he was a consignment at the sale here's another one joaquin low prices back then but you gotta remember a new truck didn't cost fifty thousand back in 1965 either so 160 for a full and the vet bills and all that stuff of course was way lower than it is now here's one here's uh the first filly by jack spot we showed you about four pictures of him and here's his first filly that was born another good ad they advertised quite often oak shadows did here's a colt that looked a filly that looks like she was uh consigned to the sale but didn't show up there's a big x but that's a dragon daughter there so that's one of them they got out of dragon that would have been 65 i think that's the only full crop they got from dragon he he was sold at the 63 sale and then i believe 64 was the only year he out east that he uh, produced before he was killed another dragon one kind of a good looking filly there really for 1965 grade mother so here's a picture of dr armstrong in one of his poas that they later gilded and i think he was a good guy again i never got the medium meet him he got out of poas 10 years or more before we got into poas and three years before i was even alive so i just want to try to honor him tonight and some other families by showing this stuff so Here's a picture from uh, Marilyn Graff. This is Oak Shadows Pequana, if I'm saying that right. That's one of their mares. I'm not sure if she's the mother to Cam's kid or not. I don't know if Marilyn's watching, she might be able to say, or Betty might be able to say. Here's another picture. I think that's Ken, probably with her there. And there's one of her foals there, Cam's Pokies Patches. And there's the Oak Shadows again. Waka Zoo is the sire, so that's why I included this, two oak shadows, and then it's a Camps POA from Holton, Michigan. Yes, she was. They said, okay, so that was, I kind of could tell in the face a little bit that that was Cam's kid's uh, mother. They had the same face a little bit. 
So here's some of these might be a little boring to you. I'll go through them faster. They, a bunch of, I have all most of the sales catalogs and uh, some of these guys can sign quite a bit to the sale. So uh, no picture here, but they're just really good references and you can kind of see some really early bloodlines. There's a GR's POA number 249 is the grandsire of this uh, gilding. So GR's arrowhead. All right, here's Oak Shadow's Running Girl. Again, you got that good-headed Marilannan's Running Girl on the bottom. And uh, this was a 68 POA by Eagle Rock. Eagle Rock, like I said, he was a grand champion POA, and he was a son of Sundowner, who was kind of a well-known Appaloosa, especially uh, in the Northwest. She was the damn a Cam's kid and Cam's Thumbelina, both supreme champions. That's right, Thumbelina was a good mare, too. So see, it comes full circle, uh, these bloodlines. Here's another Oak Shadows. Not a registered mare on the bottom, but an Oak Shadows sire on the top. Here's another picture, Weanling Colt from the sales catalog. This was a Waco's Peacock son and a Dragon's Chief. Uh, the dam was a Dragon's Chief daughter, so... All right, Tracy, thanks for telling me that was from Marilyn. Thanks, Marilyn, for watching and contributing tonight. Thanks for everybody for contributing and watching the show. We've been getting lately. I know summer was here and stuff, and I wasn't going every week. I, I hit quite a few shows in a row, but uh, when we first started our very first episode, of course, I had wonderful, awesome guests. Ashley McKenzie was a co-host with me that night, and then we had uh, Danny Boomhauer, which was a once-in-a-lifetime phone guest and uh, so we had over you know, like 3,500 views so far on that very first one and I was kind of foundered I'm like wow this is cool and then the first eight episodes or so went over 1,200 a thousand to 1,200 but lately the last couple months you know we've been struggling to get 300 and some views so I hope we get some more views on these I know this one's not as known a topic when we talk about Grand Champion Stallions or the Select Sire or something like that, we're going to have uh, more views. I realize that. But if we could keep it around 500 views, that would be, be great. So make sure you tell everybody. So I missed you too, Tracy. Maybe next year I'll go. We'll see. I might even go to Indianapolis this year. We'll find it. We'll see. It's cold. It's a little cold to travel in February, but we'll see. So here's another ad. Why well, I've been yakking another Oak Shadows ad here. So, they like their Indian names, that's for sure. Yeah, and, that, and that's not counting live. You know, sometimes 90 people watch live, or maybe 30 or 40 people are on at one time. But just watching overall views, you know, that's what I'm talking about. So, if you can't watch live, that's great. Just uh, especially if you can tune in later, and if you want to rewatch it or whatever, or tell somebody about it. So, here's three... Cool Oak Shadows Babies was all in one ad. This was 68. That was about the height of their program was 68. Because by 69, they made the decision to, uh, he resigned from the board of directors and they decided to quit raising POA. Some of it had to do with Interstate 94, which I grew up about 35 miles from Interstate 94. The high school I went to, or the, the school I went to for all 12 years of my first education was uh, probably 15 or 16 miles from Interstate 94. So that same interstate that went through Minnesota, of course, goes coast to coast, and it goes around Chicago and goes up into Michigan. And uh, they had to take some land from the Armstrongs for some ramps, I believe it was, off-ramp or on-ramp, and uh, that took some of his pasture. So he decided to uh, sell the place, quit POAs, and I believe they, they moved. But uh, and I think they moved to a pretty cool town. Somebody can comment on that. But they kind of retired and uh, got out of the horse business, of course. But uh, I believe they moved to, why can't I say the name of that town? Sault Ste. Marie, I think. Yeah, Sault so Ste. Marie. If you're from Michigan, you know what I'm talking about. It's paradise up there. So... Tracy, yeah, what if that happened to you? You'd probably call a congressman off huh? somebody. That happened to, uh, I don't know if you people know, a lot of people know about it, but uh, the Moser family, 7Ms, they had, uh, of course, Ladies Warrior. 
uh, a highway took a lot of their pasture too as well so okay here's that here's that picture again that's a pretty cool picture this was about their 67 foals but then they used that same picture for when they were going out and this is a letter kind of from the editor from the executive secretary it might have been from uh, Les Boomhauer himself saying that the home office received the startling news that Dr. Armstrong had submitted his resignation as director of the POAC uh, become effective May 20th, 1969 for personal reasons. So, yep, they, he, he quit the board of directors and they sold their POAs and the rest is history. But the sh few short years they were in POAs, they raised a lot of, a lot of good oak shadows. And again, they transferred a lot of blood around the country and promoted the sale. Instead of having a sale, they wanted people to get their stuff. Barb was telling me about that too. They just wanted to sell their stuff to people, not have an auction. So they had an ad in the magazine, everything goes, and there's a list there of all the mares and different stallions they had for sale, and, and they just dispersed, they sold everything. So here's a couple things that was in the magazine. This is the first one, but they listed every POA they'd owned and when they went out, they, they put an ad in the magazine and listed everyone. So you see in there, there's latches and there's different breeding. A lot of them are oak shadows, of course. But there's some other bloodlines in there. Of course, there's Wee Willie. And there's a Nez Pierce in there. And then here's a big one. I won't keep this on the screen too long. But look at all those POAs. They were proud of their POAs and they owned a lot of them. They created a lot. They owned some Lannans like that Running Girl and stuff in, uh, in Indian Girl. Uh, but they sure bred a, a lot of POAs in a short period of time. So here's a, a picture, kind of a parting note on the Armstrongs. We're going to move on to the Clarks and totem poles now. But uh, this is a picture of Dr. Armstrong. It said uh, they had time for everyone's children and even the new math. So that must have been a, a joke back then. You know, we still talk about the new math. This would have been in 69. And uh, there's a young man there. It looks like Dr. Armstrong's helping him figure something out. So, okay, I'm going to take a drink of water. Everybody get your popcorn made. We're going to move on to the next section of episode 24, which is about three Michigan breeders from the 60s and 70s. And now we're going to talk about totem pole POAs, Earl Clark from Michigan. And, of course, this isn't a totem pole POA, but they loved this POA very much, and they had him for several years up in Michigan. And, of course, everybody should know who this is, but this is Siri Chief. He was number two. Black Hand was registered number one. Siri Chief was born in Oregon, and Paula Cooper brought him to Arizona and made him famous, registered him with uh, the brand-new POA club, and Boomhauer gave him the second number. And he became Siri Chief, and his bloodline spread through POAs like none other. And he had his fans and his loyal fans, he still does, and he had some distractors, distractors, and haters, just like a lot of bloodlines do now. You either join them and love them, or you show against them and you don't like them. And Siri Chief was the same way. Uh, but the Clarks in Michigan happened to love him, and they loved the history behind it. Here's his. Now, this isn't Siri Chief's grandsire and great grandsire, so don't read the caption down there. It's about this, the ad I took it from. But this is Siri Sheik and, of course, Arab Tajwal Kar. They were father and son. Arab, the Arab was the sire to Siri Chief. And then, so that meant Siri Sheik was his half brother. And Siri Sheik ended up going to Paul Cooper, too, and uh, having some POAs that, you know, they were both ended up being registered Appaloosas. Uh, but he sired quite a few POAs as well, Siri Sheik. So here's a pretty cool POA you don't see a lot of pictures of. This is Siri's Desert King, and Clark's had him up in Michigan because they, they had quite a few series. We're going to talk about the Siri stallions they went and got uh, from Michigan, and I better go back to Siri Chief. You know, Siri Chief was in uh, Arizona, for the first part of his life and then she leased him Paula did to Max Allen from Minnesota for uh, the 63 season he had some sons that ended up being born in Minnesota that made a name for himself but then from 64 to 67 he went to Michigan 
she leased him to the totem poles because they liked uh, that bloodline so much that they they found the opportunity to have uh, Siri Chief. So they, they didn't buy him, but they had him up there for about three years, and uh, a lot of history was made because of that, So uh, because of Siri Chief going to Michigan. But this is a Siri Sheik son out of a Siri Chief daughter, Vicky. Of course, when Siri Chief bred his own daughter, some very famous POAs happened. Siri Super Chief and Siri Supreme Chief were two of them. Uh, but when uh, Siri's... Siri Sheik that we just seen a picture of, Sheik, Chief's brother, Red Vicky, out come this big bodied wild leopard with big spots. And he made a pretty big impact on the totems program and we'll be discussing that. So here's another Siri stallion that became famous as a sire at totems. And this is Siri Spot Cash. Now Siri Spot Cash probably spent his first 11 or 12 years with the Clarks and he sired a lot of totems. If it's totems spots, then that's his. He's the sire of it. If it's totem Siri, it's either Siri Desert King or Siri Chief normally, like that. And then if it's uh, totem sons, we'll be talking about that Siri stallion as well. And that's uh, Giza's, Siri Giza's, that Barb who hopefully is watching tonight, Fearmeyer from Florida now. She was in Toledo, Ohio. She ended up uh, owning him. So she told me the story today that I never knew until today. So thank you for that story, Barb, that her and her friend went up to Michigan. It wasn't very far away when they lived in uh, Northville. And she went to buy Siri Spot Cash. And she'd been looking at him for a long time. And when they got there, her friend liked Siri Giza's better. And we'll show you a picture. Liked his head and stuff. And she ended up bringing him home. Uh, so that's a pretty cool story there. But Series Spot Cash, of course, sired some good series, uh, some good totems, and we'll be talking about those. This is the famous picture of him. This is the picture I have on the cover photo of the Facebook group. I tried to change it the last couple days, and for some glitch with Facebook, it wouldn't let it change. I was going to put his daughter on there anyway, so they're built pretty close. Of course, a lot of people watching tonight knew and loved John Stofus from Ohio. John had Siri Spot Cash after the Clarks. He got him, I believe he was 11 when John got him, and he lived to be an old man, uh, Siri Spot Cash did, and John uh, had champions out of him when he was in his 20s, and I think he lived to be in his 30s. So just a great representative of the breed. I believe he was born in 59 in Arizona, so an own son of Siri Chief. And again, he had a big impact on totems and none bigger than this mare right here. One of my favorite all-time mares for sure. One of my early day favorites. And this is Totem Series, or Totem Spots Magella. Totem Spots Magella. And she was a grand champion mare in 73. And she was the high seller, I think, in 73. Slagle zoned her. And she was bred by the Clarks. She's an early mare, like 64. But her sire... Is him and you can kind of see the resemblance and that's where the spots come from totem spots Magella is her name so here's one of her foals by Siri chief so they bred a Siri chief granddaughter to Siri chief and got totem series wood dove who was a cool mare she looked a lot like her mother just in miniature she wasn't very big that's Harold Slagle of course He's forever famous in POAs for being the breeder of Hive Avatar. But he owned some great totems, and two of them was Totem Siri Wood Dove, and then, of course, Totem Spots Magella he had, too. So here's an early totems, Totem Spots Kachi. She ended up being the mother to Totem's, uh, I think, Siri Dust, or what. we'll talk about him. He became the the main sire for a while, homebred of the totems, and he, he sired a lot of famous POAs for them. And this is his dam, Totem Spots Kachi. Here's the series stallion I was talking about. Look at that head, no wonder Barb's friend talked her out of spots, uh, series spot cash and into this horse. But he was bred on Cooper's Ranch in Arizona and born there too. 
And uh, he wasn't a leopard, he was a roan, but he was a pretty good built PO. I believe he was 60 or 61 is what year he was born. And uh, he didn't get as famous as some of the series, but he still did his part. And, and he, uh, he was built the part for sure and had a beautiful head. Here's another picture of him. That halter's hanging on him there. You can tell he's got a cute little Siri head. Running grain cart listing to Kent, that has to be a Damon. That must be Corey Damon. It doesn't say, but I'm guessing that's who it is. So, uh, yep, Tracy, he's pretty too. He was a pretty stallion. I remember seeing a bunch of pictures of him, but again, he didn't get as famous as some of the series, uh, but he, he did do some good stuff. So the totems, like I said, when they used him, it was totem sons. So anytime you see that in a pedigree, totem son this or totem sons that, it was Siri Giza's was the sire. It's Dean, okay. It's Dean, Tracy said. I thought it might be Corey. But so here's Totem Siri Desert Knight. And uh this was their first grand champion stay. And one of the reasons why I'm talking about totems too and the Clark family from Michigan is they're the breeders of three international grand champions. And uh there's not many people around that can say they're the breeders of that many grand champions in history. There's just a handful of people. Uh, Damon's we're talking about did it. Of course, uh, you know, out in Utah, gardeners have done it now. They've had four that people have, you know, showed for them or they showed to. And one, Gene Carr had uh, quite a few. Of course, Gene, uh, Lynn Puffenbarger. But totems back in the day, all right at the same time, 70 two and 73 they had three grand champions so this was the 72 grand champion stay in totem siri desert knight and i believe totem siri dust is the sire barb can correct me if i'm wrong if she's on here or betty but there he is again totem siri desert knight when he was a little younger cool color and then his full brother there's a little close up of him his full brother is Totem Siri Desert Gold, and he won in 73. So brothers won back-to-back -back in 72 and 73. And you got to remember, an MPs had won before that, and a Siri won in 70. Then Driftwood Siri Tomahawk won right after this guy. Of course, this is pictured as a weanling here. Uh, but after that, guess what happened? Double Tough hit the scene, and then Gold Prince... So this was kind of the last, you know, him and Driftwood Siri Tomahawk was kind of the last of the series and the, a little bit of an end of an era for grand champions. And there was turning a page to way more Appaloosa horse look with Double Tough and Gold Prince. So this guy always holds a spot in history. Of course, he was purchased as a weanling for quite a bit of money. I believe he was the high selling weanling. I know he was at the sale. And that man standing behind him there where it says today, that's a Junior Reams from Missouri, the breeder of the great Reams POAs. And, of course, all you know, those years later, this would have been in 71. And in 1995, he stood in the same spot in the same fairgrounds probably. This might not have been in Des Moines. It was in Iowa, though, when he bought Doc's Tough Mister uh, from Doc and Ruth Ann Nemers and broke the record, the all-time record. But uh, So he loved his leopards, and this was a good colt when... In the consignment uh, write-up for this colt, Earl Clark wrote that he believes this was probably his best colt to date. And uh, he did go on to win right away as a grand champion. And then, as it says here in 74, Reams produced the Futurity champion colt. That was before the select sire. So the international Futurity colt was Reams Siri uh, Shatta. And that was a Reams Colt. So, and they, they had a lot of leopards by this guy. And they used him for a long time, Reams did in Missouri. They produced as many leopards as anybody. And he was one of the reasons why. So, Totem Siri Desert Gold. And there he is. There's his, he sold for thirteen seventy five, which was a lot of money in 71. That topped the sale. So, Totem Siri Desert Dust is the sire to all these guys. And he's... Out of that mare, we showed Totem Spots Kachi, who was a daughter of uh, Siri Spot Cash. And then we showed the picture of the Loud Leopard with the big spots, Siri's Desert King. So that was his pedigree there. And the interesting story that about Totem Siri Desert Dust 
is he went to Australia and helped the Palouse ponies over there. So he, when Clark's put him up for sale, he ended up going. He was a few spot, I believe, back when they didn't advertise few spot. POAs didn't know the POA people and even app people back then just didn't know the genetics as much. But that's where some of these colors was coming from was because of him. So, yeah, we got the Leopard Queen now, but you're producing a couple a year, Tracy. Some of these guys were produced like Reams were producing 10, 15, 20 a year. So they love their leopards. But uh, anyway, and then you have a totems on the bottom. Of course, she was the mother to all those uh, famous ones. And then there was a good filly that was born later. And then Barb had a stallion. She stood at her Tahlequah's place, and uh, that was totem Siri controversy. And he's a full brother to desert night and desert gold so here's another totems that they can sign to the sale dan clark that must have been a son this was an own siri chief uh full another totems here i just included as many totems pictures as i could now this one didn't have totems but the by 75 they were kind of out of it and uh Millers were starting to take over a little bit. This one was named Sun Hills, but it could have been Totems as far as that goes. This was a Desert Dust Daughter. And there's another Desert. This is Desert Flower. So Desert Dust never gets a lot of credit. I bet mo if I polled most of the people tonight and you were honest, I bet most of you never heard of Totems, Siri, Desert Dust. Tracy maybe has, but I bet... Uh, most historians even just don't know much about him. I think I've only ever seen one picture of him. And thanks to Barb and Rhett, I know more about him. Barb's one that told me he went to uh, Australia. I didn't know that. I knew my whole life in POAs about his two famous, grand, or not that famous, but his two grand champion sons. I knew about them, but I didn't know much about where they come from and, and Desert Dust. So he's a name that's kind of been forgotten over the years so here's an early one here here's Kachi again as a little bitty baby I know it's kind of a blurry picture but that's her there owned by Earl Clark Northville Michigan born June 6 1962 Siri so spot cash I mean he I wrote about him in Siri Chiefs chapter chapter 2 and spots included and uh, how you know, he was born in Arizona in the 50s and then made a big impact in Michigan in the 60s and then in Ohio in the 70s and 80s. And then he had a colt that won, I think, 10 to 20 classes in the 90s. One of his colts did cash a tough bill or one of those uh, sons of his. So uh, he had a longevity in the POA breed series spot cash did. Okay, here's Totem Spot Mini. This is a series Spot Cash Daughter that Phillips consigned to the sale one year. Here's a lot of Spot Cash. Now, this is an early one from Clark's in 62. They didn't put the Totems on this one. But as you write, read in here, please take time to read this. I'll read a little bit to you. But this is the pride and joy at the Totem Pole Pony Farm so far. Well, you can see that stout baby uh, that's a lot of baby right there, a filly. Siri Spot Cash and k &E Princess was the mother. And that's early on, 1962. Again, we're almost 60 years ago. Uh, 1975 was the registration number, T1975. For that 62 filly, that lot of Spot Cash went on to do a lot of stuff in POAs. So here's the Sun Hills again. Again, it could have been Totems. This is the full sister to Conniversy and Desert Gold and Desert Knight. So Barb Stallion, the two grand champion stallions, and then this one's the Philly, born in 73. And you can see Traverse City, they'd already moved uh, up to northern Michigan when this one was born. And they're saying that down below, the full sister to uh, Siri Desert Gold. And uh, I fully believe she's, let's see, let me get me out of here. Fully believe she's as good as gold. She's heavily spotted leopard. Her dam was a full sister to Totem Spots Magella. So that's helped, you know, all of those two grand champions 
their mother was the full sister to the grand champion mayor, Spots Magella. So some cool history there. Yep, 1900 back then. So, yep. Okay, so I remember Jackie Guthrie and her daughter Nicole riding a POA named Totem Spots Wizkid. I don't know if Jackie remembers that, but I believe she had him as a gilding in the 80s. It was one of Nicole's POAs. He was an old gilding then. Well, look here, he's 66. He was born. This was his weanling or yearling sales ad here. So he's a series spot cash son and uh, Totem Spots Wizkid. So uh, Bob Stolfus bought him for $330 in 1966 or 67, probably 67. Uh, said should mature 53, and he was a, probably a 48-inch yearling. So here's uh, some more Totem's bloodlines. See the Totem Sons on the bottom that I referred to? Totem Sons Siri Ann, so that means Siri uh, Gizes, which means son was the sire. So, you know, Steele's kind of adopted that later. They would name Twist for KS's white lighting, Tiger, and then Pants. They would put those on, and any stallion like that, they would KS's, and then the, they'd have a moniker for the stallion. Well, Clarks were doing that in the early 60s on through the 70s. They would use either Siri, Spots, or Sun. So pretty cool. Cash on Siri Pebbles became kind of a well-known POA mare, I believe. So here's an ad for when they decide to sell Totem Siri Desert Dust. And the funny thing about it is there's 10 pictures in this ad, and he's not one of them. So, you know, he was a sire, and they didn't, they weren't flaunting him. He was, I believe, again, he was a few spot. So, but... That's, I showed all these, or I will show all these pictures on here. You've seen some of these already, but that's where the captions were saying his sire, his grandsire, his dam, his daughter, his granddaughter. That's where it came from right here in this ad. So this was a very good ad, and I believe this is when he went to Australia, and that was kind of the beginning of the end of the totems. So here's Totem Siri, Desert Polly. Uh, Polly Ann was a good producer, a spot cast daughter, and of course, Desert Dust again was a sire. 1970 mare. Now, Slagles, again, I mentioned him earlier as being the breeder of Hive Avatar, and of course, he had some great POAs over the years, him and his family. And uh, he had Tom Ox, Big Creek was a stallion they had, and they had. Spots Magella, Totem Spots Magella for a long time, and her daughter Wood Dove. Uh, but they also had Totem Spots Pixie Gal, and when they crossed the Totem's mares to Tom Ox Big Creek, they come up with a name all their own, and they named it Siri Hawks. They put the two together, the Siri from Arizona and the Hawk from Pennsylvania, uh, which John Ludwig didn't care for the series at all. He didn't have nothing to do with it. He had Danny Boy, and then were two different clans of POAs. And, uh, but in Davenport, Iowa, Harold Slagle meshed them together, and they produced some pretty cool POAs. You'll still see the in old magazines, Siri Hawks, and that's where it comes from, Siri Hawks Scarlet. So this is 72. Seven years later, the same, like I say, same man would produce Hive Avatar, who helped change POA history. So here's a mare that the Clarks can sign to a sale. I just took this shot because it was in the catalog. This is the mare that was just the grandma to the one we just seen. So Chief Pontiac number 59 was a sire to this mare that uh, Clarks must have been uh, calling or weeding out or whatever. They decided to sell her. So this mare became well known. His own daughter is Siri Chief. Look at that head and neck for a 66 full totem series seed bead. I know I don't know if she became a supreme champion, but she became a pretty well-known POA. Own daughter of Siri Chief. Goldenrod's bought her for 700 and when she was in this sale. This probably would have been 67. Here's another good-looking totem. 
This is uh, the Sun Horse again, Siri Gizes, and this is Totem Sun's Coo Feather. Cool name, cool looking colt. They say dark gray. Maybe he was Ronin or graying. I mean, but he he wasn't in this picture. He was beautiful dark, dark full. That's 1964, long time ago. Totem Series Debonair, I know I wrote about him a little bit before in the Siri Chief chapter of my book. He he went on to do some stuff. Again, line bred. They were breeding Siri Chief to Grand Hotters. A lot of spot cash became a good producer for sure. Yeah, I thought that was interesting too, Tracy, because he's definitely not gray in the picture. So maybe by the time they put the consignment, he might have been a gray. Who knows? Because this isn't the Siri that had the gray. They didn't have any gray up in Michigan that I know of. So he come along later, Siri Silver Prince, which uh, is a good segue to next week. Because if I do a show next week, anyway, episode 25, 25 is silver, right? So episode 25 is going to be about the silver POAs, which started with Siri Silver Prince, again, from Paula Cooper and... Arizona, and then he went to Iowa, and of course his son Hive Avatar, and then Hive Avatar's son, the Silver Kid, who's the number one sire now in POAs, and we'll talk about other uh, silvers too, of course. So, yeah, series Silver Prince can be hard to say, if that's what you're referring to, Tracy. Okay, I'm kind of winding up now for the show and for totems especially, but. This is Totem Spots Magella again. I just love this mare so much. And she set the record in, I believe, that year in 74. I know uh, the Goldenrod mare had sold for a lot of money, GR's Raindrop, but then she came and sold for a lot too. But she was the high seller for sure that year. Way ahead of her time. 1964 mare built like that. But again, that's that Siri. I mean, look at the bottom side. It's a Welsh. You know, so you had the Siri bloodline. And of course, Boney Maroney. Uh, I don't know if there's a picture of her around. It'd have to be in the Paula Cooper archive somewhere. But she was just the quarter horse Shetland, they always called her. She was probably just a 53 inch pony. But Siri Chief bred that pony mare and got the great Siri spot cash. Then he bred a pony and got one of the great early day show mares, especially confirmation wise. And that's Totem Spots Magella. So it's kind of funny here. You have the Clark family from Michigan had Totem Series Dots Enough, and this was in 1965. And then their relatives, the Millers from Hudson, Michigan, Bill and Mary, would end up having Dots Enough POAs. And this is William E. Miller here, Hudson, Michigan. This is a 73 Philly Dots Enough Siri Angel. And you see, they just kind of continued before Desert Dust went away to Australia. And the mother there was a totem. So, I mean, this very well could have been a totem. But instead, it was Dots Enough. And I know some people watching tonight remember the Dots Enough and showed against them. But they weren't around very long. They didn't show much. They consigned a few to the sale, but not a lot. I went through every catalog that they would have, all three of these breeders would have consigned. I went through every single catalog for this episode. So everyone that was consigned was featured on this show tonight. Any oak shadows, totems, or dots enough, uh, unless I happen to miss it somehow, uh, was is going to be on this show. So this is Siri Angel. Love the Millers. We live down the road from them. That's cool. See? History coming full circle. Here's dots enough. Siri Dust Storm. Again, that... That old guy, Totem Siri Desert Dust, he, he did a lot. He did his part to promote POAs. And here, 1250 for a 74 Colt black blanket spots. And there you got two great Siri stallions, Spot Cash and Desert King. So if you ever get bored and want to do research, the series, I mean, you can lose yourself for quite a while studying all the series and the different lines of it. Oh, Kelly posted that. Okay, that's that's news to me. I didn't know that at all. We need to talk about that, Kelly. <laughs> that you 
live down the road from them. Okay, when you're a guest on this show down the road, we'll talk about that. No pun intended about down the road. Here's uh, Dots Enough Siri Red Cloud. So loud colored. Of course, that Siri bloodline, it still shows through today. I mean, you, you got some breeders like Bob Roseland and stuff. He uses probably more quarter horse than anybody going in POAs. And he still produces some like this with the huge spots. You know, and I, I think it's, and he does too, it's from the Siri bloodline is what it's from. And it just continues to, to be so dominant. Okay, let's read the comment here. Miller's had some great ponies, but I don't ever remember them showing. The mare we bought from them, Dots Enough, Honeybee, had been Mary's personal pony. Mary was always so proud of, of what Ken did with her in the show ring. Okay, that must be Marilyn that's saying that because I know Marilyn Graff bought Dots Enough Honeybee. So. And here's Dots Enough Miss Kitty. Too bad this wasn't Honeybee. That would have been a, a goosebump moment, huh? But this is Dots Enough Miss Kitty. Again, loud spots. And we're going to see when she got a little older. Here she is when she lost some of her color. Oh, Tracy, I forgot. I missed it now, but you'll have to go back and watch this show. And, uh, yep, that's what I figured, that it was Marilyn that said that. Because uh, somewhere in one of these ads says uh, something about a pure leopard or something like that or a, a true, uh, not true, I know not that word, but maybe it's coming up. But it was, it's pretty funny how they s describe the leopard, and we wouldn't do that today. So, But this is Dots Enough Miss Kitty when they consigned her to the sale. And here's Dots Enough, Siri Spotlight. Again, another Desert Dust and Spot Cash on the bottom. So they had a, a line breeding thing going, you know, in POAs long before a lot of people were doing it, long before Doc Nemers or Gene Carr up in Michigan. They were figuring out about breeding, line breeding, and they were getting leopards because of it, too. They were line breeding the series and uh, with great uh, results. So they just didn't show that much, but uh, they ended up going around the country for sure, the dots enough. Not quite as much as the totems, but uh, it was just a kind of a continuation. It's too bad Desert Dust didn't stay in the United States. Now one of my missions is to find out what he did in Australia. So I know I have some connections over there. If you guys are watching this, uh, let me know if you know anything about Totem Siri Desert Dust or if any of my historians like Tracy or Dave uh, Morris or anybody remembers Totem Siri Desert Dust and when he went to uh, Florida or uh, Florida to Australia, please let me know because that would be cool to find out and find out what he did. I'd love to see some pictures and he was a few spots, so I'm sure he produced some some Appaloosas, some POAs over there. So uh, yeah, it was something like that, Tracy. It was true or something leopard. If you go back and watch the show, look at one of the captions, one of the, the writings where it says leopard. It says something leopard. And then, of course, this one says white with black spots. But I'm not going to flip through tonight and go through all of it. But uh, it's, it was some word like that. So, Well, anyway, it's a little shorter show tonight, but we had about you know, a little over an hour. So that's a good episode. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this and learned some stuff. Uh, I like to pay tribute to, uh, you know, it's not always the Hall of Fame breeders you need to talk about. You need to talk about some of these breeders that got out a long time ago or just didn't pull down the road. They were breeding and they didn't show that much, but they still had stallions and mares and they still had a coffee table full of, or a kitchen table full of magazines and, and calendars and breeding dates and names and uh, POAs meant as much to them as it did to anybody. So I want to honor again these three families, the Armstrongs, the Clarks, and the Millers. And I want to thank Barb, Rhett, Marilyn, and Karen, and everybody else that provided information and pictures for tonight's episode. So uh, thanks again for watching. Uh, thanks for all the great comments. Hey, Terry, I didn't know if you were watching or not, so I'm glad you just... Uh, he loves the leopards. Well, he's bred for a couple of cool leopards already and some cool blacks. So, um, 
again, I, I like it when, you know, we have some newer breeders that are watching and we have some people that grew up in POAs and been in it their whole life. So that's uh, kind of cool. So next episode is episode 25 and it's going to be about silver. So, and not silver, you know, like a silver metal. The series Silver Prince is what it's going to be based on. And then everything that he did and uh, the, what the motions and everything that happened when he left Arizona and went to Iowa and how it changed POAs forever. So that'll be our next episode next time we get together. Hopefully it'll be next week. If it is on a Tuesday, it's always 6.30ish Central Standard Time. Right here live at Studio J at Jackson's Auto Family Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. Hope everybody has a great week, and uh, thanks again for watching. Please enjoy the song.